Hey Radius family, I hope you are tapping into the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ today. This is uh, the week before Christmas. This is a big week, right? Uh, it affects a lot of us very differently. You know, there are people in the network that are more of the people that have the traditions right, the lists of all the things that you want to do this week to really anticipate and, and celebrate Christmas. Uh, maybe you maybe you bake some goods. Uh, maybe you bake some figgy pudding. I don't know. Uh, maybe you have in your tradition list, you know, you like to work through some cheesy Christian movies on Netflix, um, which if that's the case and you're running out of time, I'll give you a pro tip. Uh, all of those movies are pretty much the same plot. They involve like a prince and some snow and a small town and some romance. And so if you just watch one, it'll save you a lot of time. Uh, or if you just want to not watch any of them, that may be the better option. Uh, some of you though, seriously, in a network this size, this is uh, a time of year where if you've lost someone you love uh, this year, um, maybe in the years past, this can be a difficult time uh, to see an empty seat or to see a, a change in the family dynamic. And, uh, and certainly even COVID this year, it brings a lot of grief about just changing a lot of family dynamics there. So we want to be very sensitive um, as we, we love our neighbors well, uh, especially those that are within uh, your community, to be sensitive to how you can, you can know them and love them and pray for them and pursue them if things um, look for others a little bit more difficult than they may uh, for you. So, uh, but a lot of us probably have a common denominator here that we're buying gifts. You know, we like to give presents as part of the American tradition of, of this whole season. And uh, listen, if you're a little bit discouraged, if you're like, you know, I'm just, I feel like I didn't get a good enough gift, or I feel like, you know, the things I got from last year, they don't even care about. I just, I just noticed this a minute ago, and I just want to bring to your attention this baby right here. Uh, this is a, uh, I don't know, like a 50 gallon jug. I don't know. But uh, one of my kids got this for me last Christmas. And I would just like to say that it has uh, changed my life. Not like eternally speaking, but physically speaking, um, this, is, this is a game changer. And so sometimes you just come across that little simple gift and it rocks somebody's world. So uh, don't, don't give up. You keep looking, uh, keep trying to figure out uh, how to love somebody well by buying the right uh, thing that is, is kind of fun and enjoyable. And uh, it, could, it, could, it, could, it could change their game too, like that changed mine. So uh, thanks to my kids for that. A uh, few announcements for you. We have um, a document going out this coming week called The Space Between. It's something that in our rhythms within the Churches of Radius, it's not something that we force upon anyone, but we invite people that if you have kind of a, a tendency to use the space after around Christmas to maybe the beginning of the new year, to reflect and meditate over the year that has just passed, certainly this year brings a lot of things to meditate over. And then maybe uh, do some uh, prayer and some focus over what the Lord may be doing in the year to come. That's not my secret, like, uh, coded way of saying make New Year's resolutions. It's just a way of going, you know, do you ever just have a place where you stop and just be still and ask the Lord what He's been doing and, and, and what, he continue, uh, what He may want to continue to do in you and through you? 
So we provided some questions, you know, some things that you can work through alone or um, as a family or as a church together if you want to do that. Uh, so we'll put that out here earlier this year than typical because this one has probably a lot more to process through. And that'll be coming out this week. And uh, that's one thing to be looking out for. Next, on January 10th, we're going to have a family meeting, which in this year's case will most likely be through a Zoom um, call type of gig. We'll have everybody uh, log on, do a video type deal, have the elders all sort of speak about things. Uh, listen, I know in some ways it's been sort of a quiet year for us because um, we've been sort of you know, low key with, with the way we've been operating as a culture. But I uh, don't want you to, to think that it has been uh, that way in the kingdom of God within us. I mean, we, we feel like there's a lot that is, is going on, the Lord is doing, and we have a lot of things we want to talk about you know, January 10th about how to kind of innovate and move forward in 2021. So uh, please make plans to be able to join us that night during the typical uh, kind of the time of night, roughly, that we would do the gathering. It'll be somewhere around there. Details will be to come. And that's that. We're going to do uh, a little short time today through the idea of love, which is one of the Advent focus kind of ideas uh, traditionally. And we have gone pretty well through the liturgical calendar this year in terms of the gathering at Radius. And so we're going to stick with that. Even though we're not all together, we want to still continue to have these themes. And so this is not our ideal predicament to, for me to do just a monologue to a camera and you to not be involved in uh, interacting back and forth and encountering God in that kind of way. But we still trust the Lord will use um, the seed of His Word to do really cool things. Um, I know our family, we, we have discussions on Sundays, uh, Sunday mornings about this stuff. We don't always just watch the video, but because I know a lot of the stuff in the video because I am doing the video, but we'll talk through it and we'll interact and we'll turn it into a place, a time of, of worship and of wrestling uh, through, the, through the kingdom of God. And so um, we've heard lots of good stories of lots of um, individuals, families, and communities doing that as well. So let's uh, take a second and, and pray together and uh, set our hearts right before the Lord to anticipate what His Word can do if we allow it. Uh, Jesus, we, uh, we love you. Uh, it, is, it is crazy that we get to uh, so freely speak um, about your story and about your arrival here on earth 2,000 years ago. This is a season that um, can be really beautiful. It can really um, be that, that, that your name, Jesus, is just, just on the tip of our tongue. You know, it, it can be a season that invites us to, um, to be full of wonder, to be um, full of childlike faith before you. And so um, as we look at and think about the um, arrival, the advent of, of love, uh, we want to we ask you, Jesus, to do something special in each one of us, to help us to see and understand a, a new depth of your love, a new, a new way of, of considering your affection for us. So please lead us uh, through these simple but powerful uh, words that you've given us here, Jesus. Um, fill those words um, in such a way where your Holy Spirit does something in us and they come alive. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 1 John 4, verse 8. God is love. We say that. Uh, you've heard us speak that. I mean, I can't imagine we've said it less than a hundred times on stage, you know, uh, in settings uh, just around Radius culture in the last 12 years. It is a consistent thing that we speak to one another. God is love. God is love. Powerful words of 1 John 4 verse 8. The, the word love here, you know, in, in Hebrew, you, we go all the way back to ahava, but here we're using the Greek word agape. And what it essentially means is it, it's an affection. It's, it's a willful, voluntary affection that drives us, uh, if it is true love, it's, if it's biblical agape love, this love drives us to, to treasure someone. It drives us to sacrifice for someone, to bless someone. And this is the core concept of this, how this affection manifests itself. It's a very powerful thing, right? Agape, love. And so 
it, because it's a, an act of the will, because it's a, a feeling of the will, a, a desire from us, from, from, from the one who is, who is uh, executing love, the one who is loving someone else. Um, it, it's not a duty. It's not an ought to. It's not a should. It's a, it's a desire. It's, it's an affection of the will. And so this is what love is. It's genuine. It's sincere. It's real. And it really seeks the best of another. And this is why these words are very important, to treasure, to sacrifice for, and to bless. To treasure is to, to lift someone up in such a way where you are, you are cherishing someone. You know, this is the, the root kind of idea of how love manifests itself, is that you see someone and you just go, you know, you are, you're, made, you're made in the image of God, you are special, you are priceless, you know, and you, you don't treasure them for what they do for you. You don't treasure them for even how they make you feel. You treasure them because they are them. <laughs> that's, that's why you treasure them. And then and when it comes to sacrifice, it's the idea that because you treasure them so deeply that you want to just offer whatever you can find of yours to submit it, to, to humbly kind of lay it there at their feet so that, so that that you would be able to become lesser, you know, that it, so that it makes them somehow better, which is the third thing, the idea of blessing them. In what you offer, in what you give, in how you lay your life down, how, how do they actually increase? How do they grow? How do they experience more joy, more happiness? This is the drive to treasure, to sacrifice, and to bless someone else. This is love. And so when it says God is love, it's very important that we contrast that, that it's not saying that God loves. No, we're not saying God doesn't love. I'm just saying what's being um, uh, communicated here is deeper than an action, deeper than a thing God's got on his calendar. You know, make sure I love that guy today. It's not what it's saying. It's saying God, at his essence, is love. So when you, when you think about God, what the scriptures are leading us to try to understand is that God at his core is the definition that we just gave. He is agape. He is the treasuring, the sacrificing for, the blessing of others. That's who God is. So sometimes we kind of start with this question of, you know, does God love me? Does God, does God, I don't really think God loves me. Does God really love me? And 1 John 4 verse 8, it invites us to the reality that that question is far too shallow. The question of does God love me, is, it's, it's, it needs to be predicated by a greater set of thoughts and questions that, that originate from the idea of, of God is love. So maybe if I could put this in kind of a, a, a picture, an, an idea, it would be that so imagine you're out in the desert for you know three or four days. I don't know why, just make up your own narrative at this point, but you're just walking around a burning hot desert. You don't have a canteen, you don't have any water, you don't have anything to, to drink, and so you're getting dehydrated. So you're at day three and you're in the middle of the desert, and let's say you walk up with, with, with just a dry throat, you're, you're parched, you are, you know, you're feeling the weakness of, of no hydration within you. And you walk up to, um, not, not, not a mirage, not, not a fake thing, but it's a, it's a legitimate wellspring of clean drinking water. It's just a, a fountain, you know, just an ongoing fountain, a never-ending fountain of pure, perfectly purified, clean, cold water, okay? And so you walk up to this, right? You kind of put your hand in it, make sure it's real. You're like, oh my goodness, this is real, and I am really thirsty. You wouldn't think to ask a question like, will this water hydrate me? Right, because that would be too shallow of a question. That would be, that'd be a strange question, right? The, 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 it wouldn't be a question at all, right? Because what, what, we're, what we first have to decide is, is this water, right? And if we know that it's water, then the overwhelming answer is yes. The very nature of water is that it will hydrate you. You don't have to ask that as a question. The only thing you have to decide is, is it water? And once you're able to proclaim, this is water, the need to then ask a secondary question of will this hydrate, become, to hydrate me becomes irrelevant, right? Because the nature of the water is that it will definitively hydrate you. That's what it is. That's what it does. That's when we say we need to be quenched. Water is what quenches. It's what our body needs. And so the idea that we have to focus on is really just getting it through our minds that this, in fact, is water. Once we decide that, 
then the outcome, the result of being, uh, you know, with that, being, being partaking of that water, getting that water inside of us, that's a, that's a done deal. Well, God is the same way. When you, when you come up to God and you, you think about God or you talk about God, and what you think about is things like, does God love me? It, it sort of tells us that maybe we're, we're missing the idea of who God really is because the overwhelming proclamation of the Bible is, yes, God loves you. But if you're questioning if He loves you, is it really what you're questioning here is, is God love? Because if you are close to, lo- to, to God, if you're partaking of God, then you're partaking of love. You, you are loved by God. That is, that is a simple reality throughout the Bible. John 3.16, if you haven't ever heard of that one, uh, God so loved the world. It's, it's, it's so simple, it's so clear that God's posture towards humanity is that of affection, of a willful desire for us. He wants to bless us and treasure us and sacrifice for us. That's what He wants. And so this is the way God is. And at the center of whatever painful things that you've read in the Old Testament, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of difficulty, and same in the New Testament. The whole biblical narrative is almost like you're just sort of jumping from difficult story to difficult story. But at the center of all of that, God is love. And you're like, wait a minute, but He was kind of orchestrating some of those sufferings, right? Right. And at the center of that, God is love. And when we, when we take the idea of love and treat it as a question mark, like, is God really love? Is that really who God is? Well, then it opens the door for us to now have these ways that we think about uh, the suffering of the Israelites in the desert or the flogging of Paul and the imprisonment of Paul. And we start to then create this idea of, is God love? Does God love Paul? Why, and why would you ask that? Well, because now we've created an idea that if Paul goes to prison or if something difficult happens to somebody, then in our mindset, we can't reconcile that with our definition of how love expresses itself. But the reality is if you start the other way around, you say God definitively is love. And for us to, to put on God our preferences of how love would be manifested is, is really not the way we want to do this, right? We really want to start by looking at God and understanding that He is love and let Him define love and what it, what it is and let Him show us how it manifests. And there will be moments we'll look at it and go, what? And we'll have questions for Him. Certainly Job had some questions for God. But listen to how Job and God end, end that conversation. And I think Job is adequately convinced that, that God is love, you know, that God is, God is good and that God is love. And I think anybody who goes toe-to-toe with God over these difficult suffering type situations that you may have even personally been through, if we really stay the course and really continue to draw close to this wellspring of water, we will find ourselves hydrated. And if we, and if we draw close to God, we will find ourselves in the presence of love because that's who God really is. So um, he doesn't just love, you know, he doesn't just do the act of love. He is love. He is love. His nature and essence are love. And love permeates his very being. It expresses itself through him. So maybe the first question to think about and ponder about, maybe wrestle through in your own time with your family, uh, whatever you want to do with your community, is this. Uh, when you think of love right now, if you just think about love, think about uh, someone who is loving you or a time that you have felt most loved recently, just allow your mind to go to that. What comes to your mind first? Uh, is, it a, is it a card that was written to you, a person who said the right thing at the right moment, um, someone who made you feel kind of good about yourself? Is it, um, what is it? Like what, what, when you're, what does your mind first go to when you say, when have I experienced, felt the greatest degree of love recently? Who, who did it and what was it? If, if God doesn't come to your mind first and foremost, and I don't mean like a close call first place, I mean if, if, if God Himself doesn't hold an ongoing regular position of the greatest uh, expression of love towards you, if, 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 if the emotion you feel over love shown your way doesn't originate first and foremost from God, then I think it's a good thing to process through why that is. What, what's happened? What has changed? What, what is God, is there's kind of false advertisement here with God where, he's, where we're, we're learning from His Word that He's love 
and, and, and yet, you know, we're maybe as, as individuals, we're looking at God and going, yeah, I mean, you're, you're kind of loving, but this person over here, like this, this spouse or this, this child or this parent, like that, what they did to me feels stronger and better and more like love than you do, God. That's a big thing to wrestle through. Um, and it's important to bring that to God and to ask Him why that is, to, to let Him speak to you through the Holy Spirit, to let His Word kind of help you process through this. Maybe wrestle with community. Just be honest about this. It's really important that we understand if God's going to put Himself in that position of saying, I'm not an expression of love. I am love. That if we find ourselves like really grabbing hold of, of maybe what the Bible might call more minor, more localized expressions of love, there's still love. But if God doesn't get that kind of number one award as being crystal clear, uh, the, the winner of love uh, towards us, then that's, that's the thing to wrestle through. Let's move forward a little bit. 1 John 4 verse 9. This is how God showed His love among us. This is an important attribute of love. Love, love always manifests. Remember, it, it expresses itself in this sacrificial blessing at some point. And so this is, a, this is really important to process through. If God is love, then what radiates, what permeates through Him is the action, the manifestation of love. Uh, faith in Christ, I, I know, is, is, a, is a daily walk when, in which we don't see a lot of things. And so it, not everything manifests in a clear like showing of things. A lot of our life, as Luke 7, tells us the kingdom of God is not something you always look at and say here it is or there it is. So we aren't always walking around expecting these, these manifestation or these showings of things. But love is different. At the core of love, it does manifest itself in some type of way, tangible, intangible, but it still manifests itself in a very, very powerful, very real way. And so love operates in this way of demonstration, action, movement, manifestation, something oftentimes very tangible. So which leads us to question number two. What could God do right now to manifest His love, to show His love, to demonstrate His love at the highest level? If you could give God one thing right now to say like, would you, would you prove you love me just by doing this? What's the this? What would you ask Him to do? Because 1 John 4, 9 says, This is how God showed His love among us. So 1 John 4, 9 hopefully is going to finish out that sentence. And what would be interesting is to compare what you have just thought through. The thing you would say, if God, if you did this right now, I would know you, you were love. I would know you loved me. How is the thing that you are thinking about going to compare with what 1 John 4 is about to say? Let's read it. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So what 1 John 4, 9 goes on to say is that the, the most clear bullseye demonstration of God's love, of God's nature and essence of love manifesting itself, is the sending of God's Son. And this is why the Advent conversation includes the word love, because at the core of Advent is the arrival of the manifestation, the demonstration of God's essence. And it's all in that cave. It's all in that manger. It's all wrapped up like this little baby boy, God, in the flesh, coming to earth. That is the greatest demonstration of God's love. And what isn't, what isn't demonstrated there by the birth of Jesus is further demonstrated by the sacrifice of Jesus 30-something years later. But somewhere in the giving of Jesus, His life, His death, this whole season, this is the picture of God's love. And this is what God says, whatever you ask me to do to demonstrate my love, I'm going to outdo it by doing this. And what I do in this, the giving of my son, this will be the demonstration of my essence, of my love. But is it? And this, is, this brings up kind of the third point is to think through as we process this, What's the, what's the breakdown if we ever sense that we don't feel God's love, that we don't sense God's love? Is it that God hasn't loved or doesn't love us? Or is it something in the receiving of His love? Something that is maybe not our responsibility to go do and go work and go like, you know, oh, it's always our fault. 
But yet there is some responsibility that we would receive God's love, right? That we would accept God's love. You know, it reminds me of uh, a few weeks back when uh, my son, Seth, was at his first football game. It's flag football. We were up at a game in TR, and the team had not played a game together yet. Uh, we, we show up at the game. Uh, they, they don't, you know, it, it is a different thing. I'll give it this. Like, I used to, you know, do like, coach and, and watch a lot of sports uh, stuff that Seth would do. And, uh, man, up until this year, it's kind of been like he and most of his buds are just we're just glad that they just go the right direction with the ball. But something's kind of changed around the six-year-old line where now when they get out there, man, they're, they're not just like running every which direction. A lot of them, they just, they kind of have skipped right up to thinking they're in the NFL. Like they're wanting to like sign autographs and wait for the paparazzi. And they're like overdoing it when they score. And they're like sp like, like spiking the ball. And I'm like, what is up, Peyton Manning? That was, that was an old reference. But, uh, you know, th these guys get really into it. So they're at this game. They're super getting into it. They're into it before. They like got like black lines under their eyes. It's not even sunny. And so they're, they're just intense, right? Flag football. Yeah, but they're intense. So they get out there, and one of the like third or fourth plays out there, I, I kind of I kind of remember it pretty vividly because uh, the coach, you know, sat down and kind of did his little huddle where he pretty clearly, you know, like shows with his hands the play that's going to happen, and literally just like points to the kid's head, going, "You're going to get the ball," you know. And I'm like trying to read the plays, you know. Uh, so anyway, but it was our coach; they were on offense, and so he's 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 giving them, he's telling this kid, "You're going to get the ball." And so this kid with like black eyeliner and like all the guard you know everything ready to rock the the, the coach you know starts to, starts to play and when he goes to hand the ball I mean the coach is doing everything the coach is playing the quarterback in flag football and so the the, the quarterback slash coach hands the ball into the kid's hands I don't know what happened but you know the coach had done everything to get the ball to him and just hands him the ball but the ball just kind of like he just doesn't ever close it, it just kind of goes right through his hands but instead of stopping and picking up the ball the kid just runs. He runs like he's straight up in the NFL, and he really can't figure out why no one's really trying to tackle him. Um, and he just thinks he's just like faster than everybody. What's really happening is he's never got the ball. I mean, he looks like a player, and he's running like a player, but he doesn't have the core thing that makes football football, and that's actually the ball. And um, it looks good. You know, his parents are taking pictures. We're, we just got to where we just kept cheering him on because he was already halfway down the field. And, um, but yeah, I mean, ended up the ball just sitting on the ground. And so this is why receiving God's love is very important. You know, the American church and the, our experiences with Christianity here uh, recently, especially the last 20, 30 years, has been so much of this idea of here's how you act and here's how you run and here's how you look good when you cross into the end zone. But I think Jesus so often is going, none of that matters if you don't have the ball. And the ball in this equation is, is the love of Jesus. And if, and if in your walk with Christ, that becomes abstract or unnecessary or something you assume, then you're no different than that kid who runs through this whole end zone and, and we all kind of look at him and go like, Okay, <laughs> you're, not, you're not really doing the core thing here. The thing that really matters, the thing that really changes everything is the football. That's Jesus' love. And so although our culture of Christianity can push you to want to say, what's the Bible reading plan for this year? What am I, what's my new podcast? What am I gonna? Jesus is just trying to say, listen, you got to get this one thing right. You got to be enamored with my love for you. You've got to never stop looking at, at, at how I love you from all different angles. You've got to never stop being filled with wonder over my love for you. You've got to never stop exploring the height, the depth, the width, the length of, of how much I adore you, how much I am for you, how much my affections, I willfully have affection for you. That's what Jesus wants us to do. And so maybe as you think about these next few days before Christmas, the idea that, that God sees you, the idea that God is for you, He knows you, He's chosen you, He adores you, He has affections for you. This is an idea we want to really focus on. So the final maybe question to wrestle through here is this. Do you allow yourself to just receive and rest in the love of God? Whether this is a regular rhythm of your life that, that maybe needs to be considered or just maybe a season right now in the days leading up to Christmas, are you allowing yourself just to rest and receive God's love?
just to sit in it and just let it be it. Don't, don't think about what you're going to do with the football. Just receive it and just receive the love of God. So maybe that nativity set that you bought for your, for your kids, you know, and you think this would be a good way to tell them the story of Jesus. Maybe this is a, a, a season where just sitting there and letting that nativity set bring you into a childlike marveling and a childlike wonder yourself. Maybe you thought you were getting it for your kids, but maybe God wants you to stare at this little manger scene so that you would marvel over God's love for you. Uh, maybe all those Luke and Matthew verses written on all those Christmas cards that you, you look at really quick, you look at the family picture and you put it up on the fridge. Maybe those verses that you could almost kind of just quote backwards and forwards because you've seen them so many times, you've read them so many times. Maybe it's time to sit and meditate on them. And just ask the Lord to renew a heart within you that really sees the depth, the wonder, the beauty of the words within those verses. Central to our purpose as followers of Jesus is that we would be excellent at receiving Jesus' love for us. So may you find in the next few days um, of this Christmas season, may you find the love of Jesus to be central to you. May it be the thing among all the other things that the world and even sometimes the American church kind of like urges you to be about. May you find Jesus' love for you to be the most central, the most powerful thing that drives you, that you feel that you feel attracted to, but you marvel in how much Jesus loves you.